as Dan and the other pilots transitioned from the P-40 to the P-47 Thunderbolt, they noticed several key changes. The first, of course, was the increased performance of the more modern aircraft with incredible dive rates, exceptional top end speed, and an ability to carry, carry more ordnance into combat. But the big thing they noticed was that the P-47 was able to sustain tremendous amounts of damage and keep flying and even keep performing in combat. This was a reputation it had throughout the war in all theaters of operation. Indeed, many of the German pilots who fought them in dogfights commented that they would run out of ammunition shooting the P-47s and they would keep on flying. This toughness was demonstrated in a mission the 523rd Fighter Squadron flew against a German airfield. At this point in the war, the German Luftwaffe was largely absent as far as fighter squadrons from the Italian theater. They had pulled all their fighters back to defend the German mainland against the round-the-clock bombing attacks by the Royal Air Force and the U.S. 8th and 15th Air Forces. Even so, the ground attack missions always required a unit to fly top cover in case enemy fighters did show up. Reconnaissance had spotted a large number of German bombers in an airfield located deep within a valley. The 523rd was assigned the task of attacking this airfield. It was Dan's turn to lead the flight that was flying top cover, which was actually considered a less desirable duty because nothing ever happened. In this case, it turned out to be a blessing. Dan, with his flight of four and another flight of four, stayed at high altitude to provide the top cover. The two other flights raced into the valley at full throttle and immediately saw the large number of twin-engine German Ju-88 bombers lined up along the edge of the airfield. They split off to different sides, got the German planes in their gun sights, and opened fire. That's when they immediately realized there was a problem. As soon as the bullets hit these aircraft, they literally blew apart, unlike a, a normal aircraft, which would just take bullet damage. They suddenly had the realization that these were not actual German aircraft, but mock-ups made out of plywood, hastily bundled together and painted to look like German aircraft, and they soon realized why. The Germans had gone up into the mountains and strung steel cables across the valley. Knowing that the Americans only had one way to fly in and out of the valley by flying the length of it, immediately the P-47 started slamming into these cables. Miraculously, they didn't lose a single aircraft. These cables snapped off their mounts on the mountains. Many of them dug deep into the wings and tails of the aircraft. Others, caught in the propeller until they were cut through, wrapped themselves around the length of the fuselage. Dan saw the planes starting to rise up as they came out of this mess went over and was astounded that they were still flying, but they were. They immediately turned back to base. Many of them had to belly land because their landing gear were bound shut by the cables. Others had the cables so tightly wrapped around the fuselage that they had to cut the cables apart to slide the canopies open, so several of the pilots were stuck in these planes for a while until the ground crews could do this. Although many of the planes ended up being scrapped and never flew again, they didn't lose a single pilot, and not a single pilot had to bail out before returning to base. While the 523rd was a highly successful ground attack squadron, all the men in it, including Dan, had been trained as fighter pilots and had longed to get into aerial combat with the Germans. However, with the retreating of the Luftwaffe from their theater in Italy and southern France, the opportunities simply didn't exist. They often went weeks without even hearing rumors of German aircraft operating during daylight, and the few aircraft that were operating were German bombers that would operate at night and make attacks on U.S. ground troops. There was one time, however, where they actually did come across a German aircraft. They were out on what they would call a search and destroy mission, where they would fly at low altitude, in this case armed with fully loaded 50 caliber machine guns, and fly over known areas of German activity and see what they could find, identify it, and then attack it, and then call in for reinforcements if it was a larger target. It was on one of these flights where they had their one and only air-to-air -air encounter while Dan was there. Flying at treetop level and cruising at medium speed, roughly about 200 knots, the four planes, instead of flying the regular finger four formations, were flying line abreast, meaning each plane was flying side by side in a straight line, wingtip to wingtip. As they were cruising along, looking mostly at the ground for ground targets, they noticed something flying along in front of them, going from left to right at roughly the same altitude. And of all things, it was a German Fiesler Stork. The Fiesler Stork was a very lightweight aircraft. It was designed for special operations 
aerial reconnaissance, and such duties even as artillery spotting. A modern comparison would be something along the lines of a personal Cessna with a single machine gun stuck out the back window. They were a great aircraft for short takeoff and landing, but certainly not designed for air-to-air -air combat. To their surprise, the German pilot did not even seem to notice them as they proceeded to watch it fly across the length of their formation, and as it did, each pilot opened up with all 850 caliber machine guns. They believe almost every single one of them hit it. They saw the landing gear fly off, smoke started pouring out of the engine, pieces of the tail and fuselage were gone, the cockpit was shot up, almost certainly killing both of the occupants in it. But the one thing they didn't actually see was they didn't actually see the aircraft crash. It just continued to fly off to, into the distance trailing smoke. Nobody said anything on the radio. As they returned to the airfield, each one of them landed, taxied to their individual spots, and got out. No one said a word. They all went in and debriefed, and not a single one of them volunteered that they had run across this aircraft and opened a fire on it. All of them later admitting to each other that they were too embarrassed to actually go ahead and file the paperwork for their one air-to-air, -air, quote, kill in World War II, being this tiny little light plane. As October of 1944 arrived, Dan's tour was now coming to an end. He had already been selected to go back and serve as a training pilot in the U.S. for the duration of the war. He had one final mission to fly. It was going to be pretty much a routine mission, flying north of the German-American front, attacking some known targets about 20 miles beyond that line, and returning. As was often the case, the flight element leaders would take turns as to who was the lead element. And what that meant was whoever was the lead element was in charge of navigating the entire flight to the location and back. In this case, John Newman, who had been often paired with Dan, was the other element leader. As they got airborne, Dan saw that there was immediately a problem, and it was a well-known one. John Newman was an excellent pilot, but a very, very poor navigator. And as they were flying along, he said he could literally could not see Lieutenant Newman because of all the maps open inside the cockpit that he had pressed up against the canopy trying to figure out where they were. He got him on the radio and said he would gladly take over to get them there. Newman agreed, and right at about the point where they were crossing the front line, Newman began to slow his plane down, and Dan sped his plane up so that they could exchange positions. Well, as usual, there were no German aircraft in the area. There was still plenty of ground fire in the form of flak and other anti-aircraft artillery. When large bomber formations were coming, the Germans could set up their flak patterns well in advance and estimate when the bombers would arrive and start opening fire. The bombers were in too tight a formation and too large an aircraft to make sudden movements to avoid it. However, with fighters, this was not the case. So the Germans would do their best estimate of what altitude and speed the planes were flying at. They would then aim accordingly, and as soon as they saw the American fighters were entering that bracket in the airspace, would open fire with a quick barrage, hoping to hit them before they could maneuver out of the way. This was the case as Dan slowly eased his throttle forward and started to take over for Lieutenant Newman, and when all of a sudden out in front of him he saw one large black puff of flak, another, and then finally he didn't see the third, but he said it felt like somebody had taken a telephone pole and smacked the side of his plane. Immediately he saw smoke starting to pour out of his engine. Lieutenant Newman, still not all the way falling back, pulled up next to him again and reported that roughly one-third of his engine had been blown away at the bottom and his plane was now leaking oil. The other cylinders in the engine were firing, but obviously with the oil leaking, it was going to seize up pretty soon. Dan knew he had to bail out. Not knowing how long the plane would fly, he turned around and headed south again towards American lines, locked the control column in place so it would continue flying on a level flight path, and then climbed out on the wing and laid down on it and held the front edge of the wing, intending to ride the, the damaged P-47 as far as he could, and hopefully crossing back into American lines. Eventually, the engine started to conk out, and he released his grip and slid off the back of the wing to parachute down. As he came off the back of the wing, he went into a bit of a tumble, and he said he started watching the ground go by him, and then the sky, the ground, and the sky, and the ground, and the sky, over and over and over again. Suddenly, as this was happening, he recalled back in his early flight training, they had been warned that there had been many instances of pilots bailing out 
of damaged aircraft who appeared to be perfectly healthy, but they never opened their parachute and ended up being killed when they hit the ground. And the common belief was that was because they started these spins and just became mesmerized and lost track of time. Recalling this, he immediately grabbed his ripcord and the parachute opened with no issue and he slowly began floating down. Not sure of where he really was and knowing his squadron mates had already radioed for U.S. forces to be on the lookout for him on the ground, he began floating down and saw he was coming down on the side of a hill. Knowing it would not be an easy landing, when he hit the ground, he tucked his legs and immediately began rolling down the side of this somewhat steep hill. He said he rolled probably a good 50 or 60 yards until he finally came to a stop. To his relief, when he looked up a few hundred yards away, he saw U.S. forces. He got up and began waving to them, and they immediately began shouting at him. As he started to walk towards them, they began shouting even louder and pointing their rifles. He was very confused, unsure if they realized that he was an American pilot, and obviously not wanting to get shot by friendly fire. He waited and waited, and, and couldn't understand why even after they clearly saw he was an American, they still had their rifles pointed at him. Only when they reached him did he understand. He had actually just hit the side of the mountain and rolled all the way down through a minefield, miraculously not setting a single one off, and they were trying to make sure he didn't move so they could pick their way through the known mines and come extract him out. He was returned to the airfield the following day, and as was the common belief, it was bad luck to get shot down on your final mission, so he was given one additional mission to fly the next day, which he jokingly said involved flying about a hundred yards past the front line, dropping his bombs without really aiming them, and then returning back so they could say he finished the war on a successful mission. After that, he gathered with his squadron mates, said one last round of goodbyes, and departed for the States.